It didn't mean much, but it lingers still in the corners of my mind. Still you call me to walk on the edge of this world, to spread my dreams and fly. But the future's so far, my heart is so frail, I think I'd rather people said. Amen. 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 You know, it's been, a, it's been a busy week. It's been a busy morning. It's just a lot going on. It's a beautiful day. And I don't know if you're at all like me, but I think we should just take just a moment, be quiet before the Lord, and let the Lord speak to us. Would you bow your head with me, please?
Our Father, this morning we thank you for the quiet. We find strength in the quiet and peace in the quiet. We hear your voice in the quiet. And Lord, we confess that sometimes we get too busy, too active, too loud. Sometimes, Father, in our day-to-day -day life, we just go at such a pace that we don't have time. We don't make the effort to be quiet and to hear you. Father, this morning we come and with all of our praises and with all of our songs, with all of our being, we worship you. And Father, we pray tonight, this morning that today that you would receive our worship. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time we can celebrate Father's Day we, as, we, as we remember our fathers, as we remember the good example that they set. And Father, some of our fathers are here and some have gone on to be with you. But they're ever in our mind. And they're ever before us. And we're always thinking of them. But Father, most of all, you have promised in your scripture to be the father to the fatherless. And so you are the great father. You are the perfect father. You are the example that is set for each one of us to follow. And so Father, today I pray that we might draw closer to you. As you lead us and guide us and direct us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, we have concluded another full and successful week of Vacation Bible School. And before I go any further this morning, I, I just want to just stop. And, and I really want to thank everyone who participated in Vacation Bible School this past week. And I want you to know that I can't adequately say thank you enough, uh, express to you my appreciation uh, for all that you've done. And, and unless you were here this past week, you will never know all of the commitment and all of the effort that Vacation Bible School takes. And so I recognize it, and I know that even though some of you were not able to be here, you recognize it as well. So I just want to say thank you. And I am not in any way exaggerating when I say that Walnut Street Baptist Church does Vacation Bible School better than any other church. We, we do it the best. And um, I, I promise you we do. There may be other Vacation Bible Schools that are bigger, uh, but there are none that are better. And so I just want to say thank you. One of our goals in Vacation Bible School is to share the gospel. Uh, from the littlest of the children to the oldest of the young adults, um, we want to share the gospel. And so what I'd like to do this morning is to take a few moments and, and look at this gospel, that, that this good news that we've been sharing all week. And a great definition of the gospel, the great, a great definition of the good news is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and just a couple of verses, verses 3 and 4. Uh, this is kind of like my go-to passage when I want to share the gospel with someone and kind of get it very, very tight and very succinct. And when someone says, well, what's the gospel all about? What does it mean? What does salvation mean? I think we can find the very essence of it in these verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Paul is, Paul is writing this, and he's writing it to a group of people in, in Corinth, and, he, and he's explaining the gospel to them, and this is what he says in verse 3. He says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So someone asked, well, what is the gospel? 
What is the gospel? We have it right here. And Paul begins by saying it is of first importance. And, and, and let me say just something else before I speak on that. Paul says his very first words. He says, what I have received. And so you see, folks, when we have the gospel and we've received the gospel and we accepted the gospel, we have a responsibility and we have a command that, that we need to share it with others so that they can receive it. If Paul had not received the gospel, he couldn't share the gospel. If we don't, if we don't share the gospel, then other people cannot receive the gospel. So Paul says, he, he says, for what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. The gospel is not an afterthought. The gospel is not something that we include once in a while or something that we kind of allude to when it's, when it's convenient. But the gospel is of first importance. The gospel is at the heart of what we do as a church. It's at the heart of what we do as Walnut Street Baptist Church. It is a priority. It is a necessity. And it's of first importance, and it is so important... Because it is through the gospel that God works to take people from death to life. It is through the gospel that we who are dead become alive. And so it's of first importance. And then Paul writes, he says, you know, that, that Jesus, that Jesus died, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's an important part of the gospel, to know that, that, it, that it was Christ. And now when we use the name Christ or we hear the name Christ, as I've said this before, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Uh, Christ is not um, just something that we add on the end of Jesus. But that term, Christ, is used to designate Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior. In the Old Testament, he was referred to as the Messiah, in the New Testament, they took the Hebrew and they make it Greek, and the Greek word is Christos, and the English word is Christ. But it's the same, it's the same idea, the same word, Messiah, Christ, Savior, the one who would become our, our substitute, the one who would become flesh. And a lot of times we might give an invitation, you'll hear pastors give an invitation, and they'll ask people, at the end of the service, as we do every Sunday morning, they'll ask people at the end of the service if they would like to come forward and to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. But yet we don't explain who Jesus is. We don't tell, tell people who Jesus is, who this one that they are accepting is all about. It's kind of like saying to someone, come forward and receive Narzac as your Savior and Lord. And you look around and you say, well, who in the world is Narzac? And I don't know who Narzac is, so I'm just going to stay right where I am. And it's true that the name Jesus and Jesus Christ has, has name recognition. But most of us, most of the time when we use that term, uh, people don't really understand who Jesus is. We say Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. But, but, what, but who is he? Some people think that Jesus um, believed that he was a great prophet. He was a smart person. He could, he could understand God and he could tell us how to live. Jesus was a great teacher. Jesus was a great healer. And they'll look at the scripture and they say, look at all these, look at all these people that he healed. Uh, look at all these great teachings that Jesus taught. And look at all those the simple ways that he used parables and, and stories to, to teach people. Uh, some would say, well, you know, Jesus was a great example. If I could live my life like Jesus, this, if everyone could, this world would be a better place. But many people, and I would say a lot of people, do not really believe that Jesus is God. Some would say, well, Jesus is not God. The Bible says that, that he is the Son of God. The Son of God. But in fact, Jesus is God the Son. Jesus is God the Son. Jesus is every much God as what we call the Father is God. 
And so how can a person make a decision to accept someone that they don't know? And yet that's what often happens. The Christ, Jesus, the Son, God. And so we, 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 we put that in our definition of the gospel. And it says that, that Jesus the Christ died for our sins. For our sins. And today we don't make much of sin. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't say much about sin. Because it's bad news. And, and sin is bad news. It's the very worst of news. And if a person doesn't believe that they are a sinner, they will see no need for a Savior. And before a person can get saved, listen to this, before a person can get saved, they first have to get lost. Before they can be found, they have to get lost. They have to realize that they've lost. Before a person can come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, a person has to realize that they are sin. That they're sinners. And so as we explain the gospel, which is good news, by the way, as we explain the gospel, we have to begin with the bad news. The bad news is, as Paul writes in Romans, that there is none righteous. No, not one. There's not one person today that walks on the face of this planet who is righteous. Paul says in Romans 3, he says that we have all sinned. And we have fallen short of the glory of God. That we've all sinned. We've all missed the mark. That, that, that we've all missed the bullseye. Uh, that we've all missed the potential and the ideal that God has for our life. We, we have fallen short of God's glory. Every one of us has broken God's law in our thoughts in our words, in our deeds, and we've done it more times than we could ever imagine. And, and someone might say, and I imagine I'll hear this sometime, someone might say, well, well, preacher, I used to sin, but I don't sin anymore. Uh, preacher, I, I used to break God's law, but I, but I don't do that anymore. I try so hard, and I, and I walk so close to the Lord that I, I really don't, I'm really not there anymore. And I don't know how it is for you, but let me tell you how it is for me. The closer I get to the Lord, the closer I get to the Lord, the closer my relationship is to the Lord, the greater sinner I am. Because the closer I get to the Lord, the more I realize how great and glorious and perfect and, and, and majestic God is. And I come to a, a brand new realization how sinful and how much I fall short and how, and how much I need the Lord. It, it, that's just the way it is for me. Now it may be different for you, but, but that's the closer I come to the Lord, the more I realize how much I lack. And so we look at the Ten Commandments and someone says, in fact I read this on a, on a blog this week that said, you know, we, 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 try to, we try to keep the Ten, or we teach people to keep the Ten Commandments. Well, there's no keeping the Ten Commandments. You can't keep them. You can, if you started today with all that you know, and you can't keep them for, for a week. You can't keep them for, for a day. Um, because, because we break God's law all the time because we're sinners. And there's no getting around it. And someone say, well, the Ten Commandments, I can tell, listen, the first one, you shall have no other gods before me. In Exodus 20, verse 3. Yet we have many gods. We have many gods before God. Our cars, our homes, our bank accounts, our investments, our retirements, our dashing good looks. Our technology, our toys, our rules, our clothes, our health, our family, our work, our career. Those are all gods that we put before God. Can I go on? I mean, I, I sat down and I, I guess this may just be my list. I don't know. But it was pretty easy to come up with. Our self-righteousness, our preferences. Our food, our intellect, our education, our reputation, our friends, our clubs, 
our busyness, our calendars. You know, all of those things. All of those things we put before the Lord. Now maybe not, not us, every one of them. But we put some of them. And it only takes one. The bottom line is that we are, that, that we are criminals in the sight of God. That we are sinners. That we are sinners. That there is none righteous. No, not one. That all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But notice in those verses, it says that Christ died for our sins. Do you know what that means? You know what that means? It means that death is the punishment of God on our sins. That when God created us, he didn't create us to die. He didn't create us to live a certain amount of days and then, and, and, and then die and, and to be buried. But God created us to live forever, for all time. And we come across death in the Bible in, in Genesis chapter 2. Um, and in Genesis chapter 2, death is mentioned as a punishment for disobeying the command of God. Listen to what it says, Genesis 2, verse 15. The Lord took man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it, to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. There it is. First mention of death in the scripture. God who is righteous and just, God cannot accept those who commit crimes against us. And remember, we're all criminals. We're all criminals uh, before the Lord. And so God cannot accept that, and, and that includes all of us. And God's justice, God being just, God being perfect, God being right, his justice decrees that he must punish every crime that is committed against him because he is holy and that punishment is death now when we hear the word death we oftentimes we think of oh yeah I know what death is we think of physical death um, and when we think of, of physical death we're most familiar with that but there are three kinds of death three kinds of death there is spiritual death and there is physical death and there is eternal death. Spiritual death happened a long time ago in the garden. Adam and Eve, they sinned by disobeying God. Uh, they didn't die physically, but they died spiritually. And so we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. And so as a result of that, we have all been born dead spiritually, every one of us. And also, we are all going to die physically. We are, we, we are spiritually dead because of what Adam and Eve did. And we physically die because what we choose to do. So we can't just blame mom and dad for our sin. Uh, they started it, but we continued it. We will all die physically. And I read this week, in fact, Debbie read it to me again uh, this morning or yesterday morning, uh, Geraldine Talley. Geraldine Talley. She was a resident of Inkster, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit. She died this past week. She was 116 years old. And she's believed to be the oldest person in the world when she, before she died. 116, oldest person in the world, and she died. You know what a cause of death was? Sin. Sin. Sin caused her to die. Sin will cause me to die. Sin causes you and I to die. Sin brings about spiritual death and physical death. But then there's, there's this eternal death. It's the eternal separation from God and from all that is good. We're, adult, we're born dead spiritually, we die physically, but eternal death is a choice. The problem that we have of sin, the problem that we have of death, make it impossible for us to escape eternal death 
by our good works. You can't work your way to eternal life. You can't work your way over the good, over the bad. Because no matter how good I am, no matter how good I am from today on, I'm still a criminal in the sight of God. I'm still under the sentence of eternal death. Are you with me? You feel bad yet? I'm feeling pretty bad. Preacher, this is, this is not good news. Uh, I, I, I was feeling bad when I came in this morning, and, and, and you're making me feel worse. But let's move on. You see, the scripture says, but Jesus, what? Died for our sins. God, the Son, became a man, flesh and blood, lived a perfect life, allowed himself to be arrested, allowed himself to be tried, allowed himself to be convicted, allowed himself to be crucified on the cross. And as Jesus hung on that cross, this perfect individual who never sinned a day in his life, God the Father took every sin that I had ever committed and every sin that you have ever committed, past, present, and future, and placed all of those sins on Jesus and punished him in my place. Jesus became my substitute. Jesus took my sin and Jesus took your sin and, and, and thus the wrath of God that my sin and your sin deserves. Jesus took all of them upon himself. He became our substitute. We call it, the big word is, we call it the substitutionary atonement. The substitutionary atonement. And that's at the very heart of the gospel. This, this is where we see and understand the great love that God has for us. That God the Son would allow God the Father to place our sins and punishment on him. And you see, if we take away the sin, if we don't talk about the sin, and if we don't talk about how far we fall short, and if we don't talk about how bad we are, then we'll never understand and appreciate how good God is and how much God loves us. And, and you remove all of this and you lose the depth of our sinfulness and the greatness of God's love for us. Isaiah 53 says that all we like sheep have gone astray Everyone has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Paul writes, he says, for our sake, he made him who knew no sin, Jesus, so that in him we might, we might become the righteousness of God. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, he says, he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed and Peter also says for Christ also suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous so that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but being made alive in the Spirit. We read throughout the Old Testament all of the animal sacrifices that were done for sin, and all of those sacrifices point to the work of Jesus and what he would do for us through his death on the cross. God punished Jesus so he could forgive us. And then in our passage this morning, we conclude with these words. He was buried and was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. The resurrection is an essential part of the gospel because it proves that Jesus overcame sin and death. Jesus would be still dead. He would be still in the grave if he was sinful, but he wasn't. The wages of sin is death. Jesus' perfect life couldn't keep him in the grave. The resurrection, our hope and our confidence. We're sinful. God is loving. 
and we have been forgiven. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is the truth. The truth that we're all sinners and criminals before God. It's, it's, it's the fact that we are under the sentence of eternal death and separation from God and all that is good. The gospel is to know that in God's love for us, that he sent the Son to earth to become a man, and that Jesus' perfect nature and his sinless life allowed him to be crucified and to hang on the cross. And God the Father took all of our sins and placed it upon him, and Jesus took my place. Jesus took the wrath of God for me. Jesus died. He was placed in the tomb. And on the third day, he was raised again from the dead, never to die again. God in his love and his grace has overcome our enemy of sin and death. And those who acknowledge to Jesus that they are sinners... And trust in him to save them from eternal death. Are forgiven their sins. And given the gift of eternal life with God. That's the gospel. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Paul was not ashamed to claim the name of Christ. Because he knew that God works his power through the gospel to bring people from death into life. And that's why Paul said, this is of first importance. This is of primary importance. And folks, this is of first importance to the ministry of Walnut Street Baptist Church. Now that you know who Jesus is, will you receive him this morning? as your Lord and Savior. This morning we're going to sing trust and obey. And if the Lord is speaking to you to make a decision, I encourage you to trust and obey and to follow that decision. A decision of salvation to receive the gospel of the good news may be a decision of church membership, of baptism. It may be a, a decision of a recommitment, a rededication of your life. Maybe the Lord is speaking to you in a wholly different way. But however the Lord is speaking to you and whatever the Lord is impressing upon your heart, let me say this. Trust him and obey him.